All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lance Gray. I'm a certified entomologist and a regional manager for Sprague Pest Solutions. I oversee our operations in Oregon, California, and Nevada. Um, today I'm joined by Bobby Orr. She is a board certified entomologist and regional entomologist um, who partners with me in Oregon, California, and Washington as well. Um, we're going to take you guys through a discussion today about um, everything about quick serve restaurants, and what you need to know about preventing pests, as well as meeting health department regulations. Next, thank you. Um, so a little bit about Sprague and who we are and what we do. Um, first off, we've been in business since 1926, so over 95 years. Um, you know, we work exclusively in commercial pest control. We don't do residential. Um, you know, and as a core belief to us, we believe the world need, the world deserves to eat safer food and to live and work in healthier environments. Um, on top of that, we have 16 locations service in nine states across the Western United States. As far as industries we serve, it's a wide range of them, agriculture, commercial property, distribution and storage, education, food processing and manufacturing, food retail and grocery, healthcare, hotels and resorts, housing and restaurants. Um, if you think about quick serve restaurants and what, what that means to us, if we look at the industry, that market segment, it includes fast food, uh, diners, food courts, restaurants, food kiosks, as well as cafeterias. Now with that, I'm gonna hand over to Bobby Orr and she's gonna take us through health department inspections and what to expect and what are the key things that they look for and how to prevent things as well. Thank you. Bobby, it's all yours. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. Uh, I just wanted to take a little look at what health department inspections we're involved in and how they can make or break us. Um, so uh, I went on to a couple uh, inspections that were from Los Angeles County and, um, and saw what exactly what they were looking for. And you could get a straight A, you know, you get a B or a C, that doesn't look very good in your window. Uh, or at worst case scenario, if you lose enough points, you would get an SC, which is suspended license and closure. And then you have to do whatever you have to do before they'll let you open up again. And it could be just that a cockroach infestation could make you fail. And I wanted to go through the, how they, um, go ahead next, how they go through these inspections. So this is their inspection form. And I, I know it's really small, you can't read it, but um, on the left side, there's the critical risk factors. And then on the right side, they have the good retail practices that are inspected. So uh, I wanna take a little bit uh, of analyze where we, where we fit in on this. Um, there's 47 items on this form. Uh, so right, way down at the bottom, you see that there's a, a bunch of different categories here for critical risk, you know, that employee knowledge, contamination, time, temperature, things that you, ha you have to keep under control. Um, down at the bottom, number 20, 23 is pest control. Um, and that, if you see, notice that the, the um, 23 of these things fall under critical risk. You could get a minor infraction, that's two points off, um, or most of the major ones are four points. But when you get down to the bottom, those last three, pest control, water, is it available, and sewage, sewage water. So both, basically two about water and then pest control uh, are the key factors there. Next. Under good, good retail practices, um, you have uh, these other categories, you know, food preparation, storage, sanitation, and uh, number 43 down there is uh, pest proofing. So are you able to keep pests out of your uh, facility? So that and that there is a one pointer. All those are one pointer. Next. So this inspection covered uh, two inspections here. The one on the bottom, which ended up in a closure, uh, was uh, they discovered six areas with seven live and 14 dead cockroaches. 
And this detailed inspection, they, I mean, they put these all in the notes. Crevices behind metal wall paneling adjacent to the kitchen and exterior door. These are really involved uh, inspections and very detailed. Um, the floors throughout the kitchen, they're finding dead roaches. Uh, containers stored underneath the food sink and uh, storage containers and equipment uh, throughout the kitchen. They also called out 10 flies. Uh, I guess they were pretty upset about the roaches and so they were counting the flies in the air. They found 10 live ones and one dead, dead floating in the seaweed, container of seaweed. So uh, they ended up, uh, this, this along with eight one point, two, two point, and three four point infractions, plus the 11 points for the pest infestation, cost them their, uh, their being able to be open and serve their customers. So they got a, a full closure and license suspension. On a different one, uh, it was, completely different story. They found, uh, they got dinged for two points only because there were a few flies hovering around in the food prep area and one landed on the interior surface of a, of a container, a food container. So they can get really picky if they want to and they can be reasonable also. Uh, next. So what are we looking for here? Uh, for our, our side, we are gonna be looking at things that are critical to pests not be, keeping these pests out. And there's really three ways that pests can come in. They can walk in or crawl in, or be brought in, maybe on packaging, uh, like this German cockroach. It's actually pretty common to get a delivery and cockroaches are in the packaging already if, the other, if you're getting it from a place that's infested. Um, you can have gaps under the doors or uh, loading docks are, are always have gaps, or you might have windows, like a pass-through window. As they had a, a rule in there that if the roof window was so, so big, it had to have an air curtain on it. I mean, there's just so many regulations that can, um, that can throw you for a loop. Um, so how do we keep them out? We don't just look for the pests, we look for the entry points and other ways that pests can enter. Uh, inside, we look for conditions that are conducive to breeding and harborage of the pests, and we will monitor areas to detect the, those first invaders and be able to act really quickly and get everything under control really right away. Next. Um, this was a, a, a case where they have rodents getting in. This is a grocery store, and this is on the roof. Uh, so we look at everything get up on the roof, we notice, oh, look at these trees are all run, rubbing up against the building. That's gonna give rodents access to the roof. Then we notice this, where all these pipes were going in. I mean, it's hard to see that hole back there, but the, the rodents had chewed their way into the building and they were coming out um, in the upstairs areas and running around inside that store. So once we found that opening, we were able to correct that and make recommendations on the conducive conditions. Next. So areas that offer harborage uh, that we wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily think of looking, um, really like uh, when there's a gap between one surface and another, uh, that's a great place for roaches. They can get so thin when they're going through these openings. Uh, attic spaces, uh, wall voids, uh, floor sinks, um, drain lines. We're gonna take a look at all these for the different pests. Uh, so we're going to look for those kind of conditions. Next. We also assess the exterior to identify landscaping and storage practices that are conducive to pest harborage and breeding. Uh, this, we've seen a big, big boom in rodents running all over the place since the people have, you know, we've been spending less time outside, a lot of closures. Um, we also see debris. Uh, this picture on the right is um, at a loading dock and there was so much debris there and leaves and junk down in that trench drain that there were roaches breeding in there and walking into the store. Next. Let's take a look at some of the pests. Um, cockroaches, there are several species. We have American and Oriental are, and now Turkestan. 
They live typically are outside and then they come in and invade. Uh, German roaches typically live inside and they get transferred from place to place on packaged you know, boxes or machinery or uh, sometimes they're even brought in on um, garments or their lunches. Uh, had them coming out of lunches into uh, restaurants. Uh, so uh, it's really gross because they, you know, they eat on all this gross stuff. They walk around in it and then they walk around on your clean dishes and they barf on your dishes and they defecate on your dishes. And oh, that's one little speck like that and you wouldn't, you wouldn't see it. And then you put a beautiful serving of food on there and the people like the food so much that they take it in a to-go care package to take later. And then they leave it in their car for a few hours and that bacteria starts growing and multiplying. And then you could have a customer getting sick. Next. Uh, so where do we look? Um, Harborages, any kind of cracks, crevices, especially near food and water, damp, uh, dampness for cockroaches, certainly uh, under sinks. Uh, the harborages are just everywhere. You just have to think you know, okay, if I was that small, where could I hide? And, and it just opened your eyes. I've seen them coming straight out of drains. You might have a next door neighbor if you're on a strip mall that had, maybe it's been vacant and the drains have dried up and the roaches can come up from the sewage and then invade into your structure. There's a lot of ways for them to get, exploit your, your space. Next. Uh, rodents, uh, they can use all kinds of thing, ways to get in sewer lines. They're going to go through the smallest cracks. You know, a mouse can get through a, a dime size opening and a rat, uh, a nickel size. If, they're, if their skull can fit through, they can get through. So um, we look for those kind of gaps. We look for the evidence and uh, make our recommendations to fix these things. They do carry a lot of diseases. Um, just a few listed here. I had, had to keep that short. Um, hantavirus, probably heard about the big outbreaks up in Yosemite where people died from that. Um, salmonella is a big one for in restaurants because they're walking through nasty stuff. Um, and then I've seen these rats that were just running around and feeding right on the produce. You know, they're warm blooded. So if they go in the produce cooler, they're they're not going to freeze to death. So they can go in there and eat the avocados and then, you know, you touch something that has, that they've been feeding on. Theoretically, you, you've got urine, body oils, um, droppings, and that's going to transfer diseases to your hands and you didn't even know it. So you just can't have to have a zero tolerance. The flies are another big one. Uh, we have large flies and small flies. Uh, large flies typically are they're coming from outside and we'll talk about them. Um, and small flies are trickier because we have, they're breeding inside. Once they get in inside, we have to figure out where they're breeding. And that may involve plumbing lines, all kinds of things. Let's take a look at the large flies first. Uh, we call them filth flies. Uh, they really like to go to garbage, um, house flies, really like um, to manure, but they'll feed on anything. They can lay 500 eggs. Blow flies typically like dead things, but they'll be in garbage also. Uh, and they can lay up to a thousand eggs. So if you can imagine if they, if one got in and got on something that was, you know, you're cooking it, you're putting it all together and you didn't notice they laid eggs on it. And now they're, they're developing on your product. Um, under optimal conditions, their life cycle can be completed seven to 10 days. And the eggs hatch within a day. So it's, they can go crazy. Next. Um, when the maggots are, go through their three larval stages, uh, then they want to crawl away to someplace nice and cool and dry to pupate. And they have been shown to go 50 feet. So if you have a dumpster that's within 50 feet of your building, maybe it's along the back side of the, the building like this picture, uh, they can crawl over to your doorway and get in. They are really tiny. Um, and just any kind of gap at the bottom of the door, 
think, oh, that'll keep the mice out, but it won't keep the maggots out. And now they're inside and they're, they're pupating inside. Uh, so uh, we look for these kind of things. Smaller flies, uh, typically, well, look at fruit flies first. Uh, fruit flies are, lay their eggs in fruit in the field and their eggs are there. Uh, so when you bring the fruit in, it's freshly decaying because you just got picked. And so these flies are developing and eventually they'll emerge. Uh, if you don't, if something gets, is in there too long, uh, then they'll start emerging. And once they've emerged in your, in your store, now they're gonna go find someplace great to, to reproduce because they don't have any fresh fruit around or they'll use, um, they really like to go in drains that are, have freshly decaying or fermenting things. So beer taps, soda drain lines, um, any kind of fresh fruit that is somewhere, uh, they, they will breed in these lines. So you know these are habits that you do every night. You pour the water down the, the beer tap and the soda drains. It's just, there's things that we can do also. Uh, we have tools that can break up that, that stuff. Next. Two more are the forward flies and drain flies. Let's talk about drain flies first. They're also called moth flies. That's this one on the right. Um, it's, it's really a cool fly. Um, it's really unique and easy to identify. It looks like a little moth. Uh, it's about maybe a quarter inch, three eighths inch long. And it has these parallel wing veins that are really distinctive and easy to see. These drain, these drain flies breed in drains that are inactive. Very common in bathroom or the drain in the bathroom because not a lot of water is going down that drain. Um, so when we see these, we look at where they, where they belong, you know, where they're gonna come from, and we're able to identify these things for you. Um, Forward flies, man, they're amazing. They can breed in just about any wet area with organic debris. <clears throat> um, real easy way to identify these flies is to look, see that red arrow is pointing at the, I would, what I call the thunder thighs on these flies. They're really the only little fly that has that. Uh, so it makes them a little bit easier to identify. Um, I've seen them uh, in regular drains. Um, I've seen them coming out from between the grout of cracked grout, um, and I'll get to a picture of that in a second. Um, broken grout and tiles, they allow moisture and organic material to uh, get underneath the tiles and support a lot of larva under that tiles. Next. I've also seen them in drains uh, like this drain that was filled with uh, grease. Uh, any kind of uh, flat drain, like underneath this, this sink, uh, kind of level, it's always gonna have a little bit of debris in there. Uh, so they can breed in there too. And if you get, allow that uh, bacteria or that, um, that soil to get underneath those tiles, it's really gonna be a great breeding ground. So areas that are wet have to be cleaned more often than areas that are typically dry all the time. Next. So the FDA has all these tolerances, you know, that they're, you know, for manufactured food. And I was curious to find out what their standards were. So I looked some up and they said that you could have 20 or more maggots in a four ounce can of mushrooms. And I'm like, what? So I looked further. For every three, one quarter cup of cornmeal, the FDA allows an average of one or more whole insects, two or more rodent hairs, and 50 or more insect fragments, uh, and one or more fragment of rodent droppings. I was, I was shocked. There could be 450 insect parts and nine rodent hairs in every 16 ounce box of spaghetti. Now, what is the tolerance of your customer to one insect or hair in a serving of your food? I'm thinking it's a little bit, very much lower. The tolerance is what, zero? So what happens to us when they find that one insect? Well, now you're gonna get closed down, you're gonna get complaints, you're gonna get social media posts from customers, your employees, you know, they 
employees have been known to, to uh, expose this kind of thing to, the reputation and the cost to control it. So um, it's just so much uh, at stake that I will uh, let me turn you over to Lance and he can talk about the solutions here. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bobby. Nice job. Um, so everybody, I just want to talk a little bit about Sprague and how we approach things with what we call our quick serve program. So really, to us, there's a few things we're going to do every time. Um, first off is we're going to inspect the premises. First thing we're going to do is we're going to show up. Service is going to start with an inspection of the facility. So we're going to start outside or inside, whichever one it may be. Um, we're going to look for rodent droppings on the exterior of the building. We're also going to look for dead or live insect activity. You know, so a lot of people have flower beds, whatnot. Could be uh, foundation cracks in the concrete. We're going to look for ant tissues. Could be crawling insects that are in the bark dust, flower beds, whatever it may be. Sanitation and structural conditions outside. As you guys saw Bobby talked about earlier, we're going to go out and take a look at the dumpster enclosure. Hey, is the trash all cleaned up? Are we washing down the slab outside in the dumpster enclosure to make sure it's clean? We don't want grease built up and things like that. Um, vegetation overgrowth is really important. Um, whether it be we don't want uh, limbs touching buildings, there are certain types of ants, for instance, that will walk into your building from a limb that's touching the building. Rough rats, they can get into our building climbing on the same tree limb and get into the building, get in the ceiling. You guys remember the picture that Bobby showed earlier. These things start to tie together, right? It's like the insects use it as a travel way. Um, rodents will too. Um, the other thing too we're going to look at is rodent proofing. Do we have good door sweeps? Do we see any obvious holes anywhere? Any damage in the siding on the building? Um, could be that the foundation has been undermined, for instance. That's a good place to look too. So as we're going around the outside, we're looking at the whole picture of the facility and saying, hey, where are the entry points or places for harborage that are outside? Next. Um, so interior inspection is going to be the next thing we're going to talk about here. Um, first thing we're going to do every visit, we're going to check in with the manager. Whoever's on duty that day or your designee, we're going to come in and find out, hey, how are you? Do you have any issues going on right now? Is there anything your employees have reported to you or anything we need to know about before we get started today? Next thing we're going to do um, we're going to inspect the kitchen and food storage. We're going to go through and look. We're going to look for droppings. We may be looking for spots of urine, grease marks from rodents. Um, they have a little bit of oil and what's called sebum in their hair. Um, we're going to look for things like that. Um, we're going to be looking in the corners and the crevices and the dark spots in the kitchen or in food storage. Um, you know, looking at the floor drains. Sanitation and structural conditions is really important to us. So floor grout, is the grout and the tile starting to crack? Do we, see, do we see door sweeps that are bad from the inside? Sometimes it's not so obvious from the outside, but from the inside, you can see the light shining underneath. Um, are there window frames that are cracked? Could be causing a fly problem. Um, we're gonna be looking at all these type things. We're also gonna take a look at your drains as we go in under sanitation and say, hey, do we see buildup in there? Does the drain smell? We're going to use our senses, right? What do we smell coming out of the kitchen? Sometimes that tells us something about maybe something needs to be cleaned better. Um, next thing we're going to do is we're going to inspect the dining room. Take a good look around. We're going to look, see, do we see any fly droppings? There are little brown specks that may be around out in the dining room on light fixtures. Sometimes flies like to land on light cords. We're going to look for those things. We're going to look around the window frames to see if we see flies. We're also going to go and we're going to see, hey, do we see any ants that are trying to come in? Now, if you have a drop ceiling or an attic, we're going to take a look. And frequently, if we have a drop ceiling, we're going to place some traps in that ceiling so we can actually monitor activity for mice or roof rats, either one. Um, because what we don't want to do is have rodents start setting up shop in your ceiling and nobody knows about it until one day you get a call at home and a mouse fell out on the table in the dining room because that's the last thing any of us want to have happen. 
So we're going to proactively be looking up there to make sure you don't have a problem. And the last thing on this list here is um, looking at the break room, employee break rooms. Um, sometimes our folks, we have learned over the years, sometimes um, employees can bring in problems from home too. Um, whether it be they store something in their locker, um, it could be their practices too, or how they, you know, how well they take care of the break room as far as throwing away old food and lunch and things like that. So we're going to take a good look in there too and make sure that the practices that, that they're engaging in are the right things for your restaurant. Now, as we are inspecting, one of the things we're doing is monitoring. We're only at your restaurant for so long out of a month, right? Whether how often we're there, it's a snapshot in time of the time that we get to see, we get to interview people and do some detective work. Well, we're gonna do monitoring as well. So if you look at the corner there on top of the light fixture, um, that's an insect monitor is what that's for. So that's kind of a tool for us to be able to use that's going to give us some insight into what's gone on while we weren't there. So insects tend to be a glue trap as a prime example, right? So if we get an insect caught inside that monitor, we can actually look and it's going to tell us something about what kind of pest pressure. Do we have a roach problem or not? At least we have some proof there. The other thing we have is flying insect light traps. Now we can, we can capture the flies Bobby was talking about earlier in that light trap. Um, it'll tell us what kind of flies too. So we may catch some small flies, we may catch some large flies in there. That'll help us try to go figure out what to do about it and some of the detective work because we can look and say over this period of time, we see this much activity going on, um, where to go look, right? Are the flies coming from by the back door? So if I have a light by the back door close to the dumpster and it's a large fly, a filth fly as Bobby touched on earlier, maybe the dumpster enclosure, maybe where the flies are coming from. So all of a sudden that detective work starts to come, turn into a plan about what to do about things. At the same time, we're gonna monitor for rodents as well. So we can use traps, mechanical traps. It can be by the doors. Freight guys come in at night, right? They prop the door open to unload um, all your goods and bring them in and restock your restaurant. That's gonna usually happen in the middle of the night. Rodents are most active. So traps outside are really important for that reason. Now, electronic monitoring, I touch on this here. Um, this is something that we have really made a focus on bringing, bringing into the field for our clients is in ceilings. So ceilings sometimes are hard to access, right? It's not easy to get to them. Um, you think about people getting on ladders from a safety standpoint, it's not necessarily something we wanna do is have people on ladders, but it, with electronic monitoring in a ceiling, when we come in, we can tell if anything has happened up there during the entire month, besides just capturing something. So this gives us a world of information we can share with you and tell you where something may have happened or where it didn't too, which sometimes is just as important. Um, we also, other tools we have available are cameras. We do use them periodically with your approval um, to help us solve a problem. So somebody, say we get a call and you had a customer complaint, they said they saw a rat. I'll just, we'll just make a story here. We could set up a small camera to detect any activity during the middle of the night. And then we will have some data between that and electronic monitoring to tell us what's going on. Um, it helps create the story with some data to help prove or disprove something. Um, the last thing on this is non-toxic monitoring bait. So in some circumstances, uh, we'll use bait, a rodenticide that is not toxic. Um, it is just literally a block of grain most of the time where we'll put that in certain places. The rodent will chew on it and eat it. And that'll let our service technician know that, hey, there's something going on here. We need to react to it. So we really want to minimize, um, you know, how much rodenticide or pesticides we're using you know, because sometimes it's not necessary, but we still need to have the monitoring to know what's going on. Now, services and treatments. Um, there's a whole host of things that can be done and options that people have. Um, first off, you know, if you were to, we do service, first thing we're going to always do and everybody's going to have is a monitoring equipment. Now, that's going to vary depending on the size of your restaurant, 
um, what you're serving sometimes, right? We're gonna customize a program for you that fits your business at the end of the day. What, what's important to you? We're gonna to listen to you. Um, Bobby touched on earlier the slides about uh, um, the health department inspections. Los Angeles County is different and has different pest pressures than say in the Puget Sound, right? It's warm in Southern California year round. So we're gonna customize things somewhat even across the nine states we service. We're gonna make things a little bit different to fit you and fit your local area. Exclusion. So, you know, part of what we do is we're gonna look, we're gonna inspect, we're gonna monitor Things change, right? Buildings wear, we remodel them, we have to, re we have to fix them constantly, right? Things wear down. Um, we'll recommend exclusion and frequently we can offer solutions as well. Um, we can do some repairs. We have staff that's trained to do this type of work. And uh, you know, we're happy to partner with customers as well to do this type of work, whether it be to keep birds off buildings, it could be to you know, fix holes, um, sealing up rodent proof in buildings, putting on door sweeps, there's a whole list of things. Drain treatments. Bobby touched on earlier about small flies. Now, small flies breeding and getting into, into your facility is not a good thing. I'm sure everybody has had a glass of wine sitting at dinner and had a fruit fly buzz around their glass. Um, I don't think anybody likes that or a large fly. Now, there are some different types of drain treatments out there using. Um, we use some different types of bioremedial products that will eat fat soils and grease to clean the pipes. So if we take away the food source for the insect, then we can eliminate a lot of insects or greatly reduce the activity. Besides the fact too, that'll help keep your restaurant smelling better as well. Um, also, another thing we're gonna do, we're gonna treat the current pest activity. So with our monitoring as part of what we do, we're gonna come in and either make some recommendations to you and let you know what's, what's going on in your restaurant, but also we'll treat for it. We tend to try to use a minimal impact and a very targeted approach. So for instance, if we have an ant problem, we, met, we don't need to spray or treat your entire building. We need to treat the area where the ants are. We tend to work heavily towards using baits that are as minimal toxicity as possible at the same time being highly effective. So we take a much more scientific targeted approach to solving problems. Another service that we've offered and we started doing literally about a year ago is with COVID-19 as everybody knows what that is. Um, we started offering a disinfection service and we have done this for hundreds, probably thousands of businesses in the past year. So that is another service that we offer frequently on short notice. Some people have us do it as a preventive measure at this point. Um, but we're happy to provide that too. And web removal. So around the fronts of our buildings, um, we're gonna clean up the webs around the front door. If somebody wants to do more than that, we're certainly happy to do more. Um, but keeping, up, keeping cobwebs cleaned up off the building makes it look a lot nicer and uh, the aesthetics matter too. And fly control. Um, we have insect light traps we put up now there's different styles of lights. There are lights that are more of what we would call front of house. So aesthetically, they're very pleasing to look at. Um, there's some new technology coming out using LED lights where you don't really see the bulb. And if you really don't know what you're looking for, you don't realize it is a fly light to capture flies. We also have back of house lights we would put in around drive-through windows, kitchens, prep areas. Um, to do all the things we want to do, which is minimize the risk to our clients, right? At the end of the day, that's what this is. Great customer experience, keep the facility clean, make it good for your employees too. Now, a couple of things here for you to think about um, that we do. We have a couple of tools for customers that we use. Um, the first one is a cut, what we call a customer portal. Now, through the portal, you can do a lot of different things. Number one, you can request service. So you can send in an email, make a phone call, whatever you may need to do and say, hey, I wanna add this service. I wanna put another restaurant on service. Whatever it is you wanna do, you can do it there. Um, online bill payment, we do that there as well. Um, 
couple of the coolest fe feature I think to me from an operational standpoint for, for a client is this, you can create trending reports and custom alerts for your business. Now, say for instance, you have, you have 15 restaurants you, you oversee. You can customize a report where you can get an alert. Our, say for instance, our service technician is gonna go in and service in a, a restaurant, one of your locations. He's gonna go through inspect the building. And while he's there, he finds that a built, uh, the back door at restaurant X needs a door sweep. We can customize your report and alert where when that data is, is synced into the system, it would come through as an email alert to you to tell you restaurant X needs a new door sweep. And here's why, what door. So we can give you that information and share it with you. We can also create trending reports for all your restaurants. So you can really customize it to get a dashboard to pull all your information together in one place, which can be super helpful for bill payment and master bill twos. Um, the sky's the limit, really. I guess to me, it's we wanna make it easy for you to get the information you need to make good decisions about where you spend your time, where you need more attention done. And it could be too, um, if we see sanitation issues, we're gonna bring those up and we're gonna make sure that you see that. So that customization of the dashboard, we'll call it for you, that's really up to you to decide. We'll build it the way you want it. And that's part of what we provide our clients. Now the other portion of the slide here is online service binder. So a lot of the restaurants, health departments, as we all know, they require that you have a service binder on site. Now we came up with what we call an online binder. So if you were to look, you can take your smartphone and there will be a QR code. You can put it up in the office if you want, and you put it on the wall. And basically what it'll do is going to give you access to service reports, which the health department's going to want to see. When was, when was my service um, last done? When did they come and go? Um, they're going to want to know what happened. Hey, they may want the last year's records. They're going to want to know material, what materials were applied. As part of our service report and what we do, we record the materials that were applied, any captures, any pest activity, any recommendations, they're all in that service report that's included in there. Um, the materials will be in there with the most current uh, SDS and label for the pesticide that we may have used. Um, it'll also have a lot number, who applied it and where. This really minimizes your risk as an owner and, you know, it, and it also gives valuable information to employees or or potential, you know, the health department or customers who may have a concern. Um, the other thing it's gonna do, it's gonna give you information about your service technician. One of the things the department may ask for is, hey, who was the guy who came in or girl? What's their license number? And how long have they been doing this? Our employees go through, they have training and uh, good, you know, GMP practices, HACCP. We have detailed training and all that information is available to you as well. Um, so the service binder we think is a great tool online. You don't have to worry about losing paper. You know, people print out a service report in the old days, client puts it in the, you know, on the weekend say, somebody puts it in a, in a folder and then it gets lost, the health department comes in, we can't find the record because it got just misplaced or the, bind, the paper binder did. With the smart online binder, all you have to do is just open it up and there it is. It's always going to be available to you. You don't have to worry about losing it. Um, so that kind of takes us through the slides that we had. And uh, at this point, I guess we'll open it up. Does anybody have any questions? All right, first question I have here. Um, question was po posted here, how can Sprague help me meet my corporate auditing requirements? So a lot of franchise groups, um, they have, they come in and they're audited periodically, some of them every few years, they have to remodel their facility. They also have health standards and expectations, right? We want to meet a certain level of expectation as far as cleanliness, housekeeping, pest control, whatever it may be. Um, with our dashboard that we touched on earlier and our customization on the, um, on the portal side of things, 
we can really help you customize to get you information in advance. So we're gonna let you know that a problem, a potential problem is developing before it becomes one. That's part of where the inspection and the monitoring is so important. You know, the customization of, you know, if you wanna even know as things as far as, hey, pest activity, right? It could be that you wanna know the first time we see one roach or we see evidence of one roach, you may wanna have an alert that automatically tells you now, say we found the one roach, we're going to look and we're going to find it. We're going to also tell you what do we think is causing the problem. It could be that that uh, we have a drain that ha that's cracked. It could be that we have excessive buildup of grease on a pipe. We're going to recommend all that to you. So if you think about passing an audit, knowing things in advance is a great way to do it because then also you have the data to go back and say, hey, we need to invest this money to solve this problem. And so the more proactive we can be, the better off we're going to be. Great question. All right, another question was posed here. What do I do if I received a bad health inspection report? Um, the first thing I think you want to do is get a hold of your service provider and talk to them about what was going on. What did the department um, cite you for? Um, what specifically do they think are the issues and whether it's Sprague or another provider is I would recommend have your service technician in the field office that they work out of, make sure you get in touch with them right away, let them know so you can have folks out on site, inspect the facility and, you know, figure out how do we get reopened or solve the issue as quickly as we can. And, you know, we pride ourselves on being very proactive and we will get out and help you solve it as quickly as we can. And here's another question. How can Sprague help me prepare for my depart um, health department review? Um, I think a lot of what we do is, you know, the Proactive approach, I think, is really, really important. It's, you know, making sure you're doing all the preventive things up front. Um, have a good conversation with your service, with your service provider, so, you know, service technician. It's so important to talk to them and have a conversation. So when our service technician shows up, they're going to check in with you. But when they get done, they're going to check out with you and talk to you as well. And they're going to tell you, what they did, what they saw, and what they recommend, right? So here's what I did while I was here today. Here are the things I observed that you should be aware of, and here's what I recommend to solve it. So I think a partnership with your provider is hugely important because if you're both on the same page, your chance of the health department or any kind of inspection becoming a negative experience is much slower if you have good communication with your provider. There's another question. Um, what's the best way to manage my pest control across my multiple locations? Um, to me, I think it is the number one thing to do is use, an, use a service where you have a, plat, a portal or a platform that's electronic where you can really capture all the information. Um, to me, I've found that in my experience, whether it's restaurants or it's, it could be, um, you know, convenience stores. If you have multiple locations you're, you're managing, the ability to capture the information and aggregate the information you want to see that a provider can provide, um, I think that helps you stay in front of problems and proactively you're working on the right things. So whether it be you wanna go in and you customize your reporting it makes a big difference, right? Because if I, you only have so much time, all of us do. If you have a dozen locations you're managing, you only want to know about the big things, right? So the things that are coming up or the proactive things, you may, you can customize it. I could look and say, I want to know about things that are going to be a problem down the road so I can plan for things. I also want to know if we catch a roof rat, I want to know immediately and know what we're doing about it. So there's a risk and reward to things. Um, and I think the customization of a dashboard, if you will, 
um, can be one of the best things you can do for yourself, regardless of who you're using to do your service. That's something I would ask for. All right, is there, um, does anybody else have any questions? All right, well, um, with that, um, I don't have any other questions or in the screen. I would just want to say thanks everybody for attending. We really appreciate your time this morning. And uh, there will be a recording that will be posted online later and uh, that'll be coming out. Um, thanks so much for the time and uh, you know, follow Spray Pest Solutions on LinkedIn to keep an update, keep, an, keep up to date on upcoming webinars and events. Um, we post these fairly routinely. Um, thanks for your time, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your Monday. We appreciate your time.